Welcome to Graphic Novel Collection Development for School Libraries, presented by Library Pass and Comics Plus. This session will be moderated by John Shibleski in conversation with our distinguished guests, Casey Boyd, Joy Harvey, Angie Mahalik, and Kate Zakshesky. Today's webinar is presented by Library Pass, which curates high interest, immersive digital content that helps libraries expand their reach and engagement without breaking their budget. Our Comics Plus platform offers unlimited simultaneous access to thousands of age-appropriate digital comics, graphic novels, and manga in collections curated for elementary, middle school, and high school readers. We also offer our complete collection, including thousands of additional titles for older readers like Blade of the Immortal, The Boys in Heavy Metal, for public and academic libraries. Learn more at comicsplusapp.com or contact your sales representative at Mackin, Brodart, or Biblioteca for pricing information. And now, enjoy the session. Um, my name is John Shableski. I'm your host this evening. Um, and our conversation uh, tonight is about graphic novel collection development for school libraries. Um, our guests on the panel tonight are Casey Boyd, Joy, Joy Harvey, Angie Mahalik, and Kate Zakshesky. And real quick on the summary here, adding graphic novels and manga to your school's library collection is a surefire way to drive uh, circulation, but it can also bring scrutiny and or some challenges from parents and administrators who don't believe they're appropriate for young readers. Ensuring your collection development plan is up to date with your administration goals and objectives is a critical first step to getting support for your efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I want to go ahead and start. We're going to go in alphabetical order for our guests to introduce themselves. Casey Boyd, uh, we'll go with you first. Hi, uh, my name is Casey Boyd. I am a middle school librarian. I work for the District of Columbia Public Schools in Washington, DC at Jefferson Academy. And next we got Joy Harvey. Hi, I'm Joy Harvey. I am the coordinator of library services for the Lincoln Public Schools in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Angie. Hi, I'm Angie Mahalik. I am the librarian at Coppell Middle School West in Coppell, Texas. And last but not least, Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Zakshesky. I'm the librarian at Yuma High School in Yuma, Arizona. And before we get into the questions, let's see St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Hello. Maine, Fresno, California. We've got folks checking in from the Philippines and Ireland. Thank you very much. This is really pretty cool. Um, Okay, so I believe at least two of you started your collections for graphic novels um, in, in your schools. And some of the things that the conversation that began in the public library space was, does your collection development policy reflect your community? How does it impact the decisions you make on the books that you put on your shelves? And, and Kate, I wanna start with you since you also got a background as an academic librarian who came to the school market. Um, what did you discover when you got there? What kind of a collection did you have in Yuma? When I got to Yuma, it was really interesting. We had a very small collection. It only uh, comprised about 3% of our total collection. But when I look at looked at the CERC stats my first year there, it was uh, the graphic novel checkouts were 32% of our total checkouts. So we had a tiny, tiny collection, but huge interest. Um, so that's when I kind of decided, okay, let's push this farther. Um, and I uh, applied to the Eisner Graphic Novel Growth Grant and won that. And that's kind of what launched me into growing our collection more and more. Um, and it was mostly manga when I got there, not a lot of nonfiction, not a lot of biography. Um, and now my graphic novels take up about 20% of my total collection and it's 60% of my circulation. And that's what kids want to read and that's what I want to give them. Nice. Okay, I'm going to, uh, and we're going to get to the conversation about developing your collection development policies here in just a moment. I just want to create foundation for people watching as to what you walked into or what you started. Uh, Joy, I want to go to you next. Um, this is kind of a new territory for you, right? Um, well, maybe at the district level, yes. Um, okay. I started um, when I began um, librarianship in a middle school. Uh, it was the first year that it opened. It had a small graphic novel collection and um, students flocked to it, loved it, especially our ELL students. And so 
I have seen the graphic novel collections grow in the, the schools that I've been in over the years. And they're no. empty too, like Casey said, very empty. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angie. My experience was very much like Joyce. Um, we had a small collection when I began and I have steadily grown that collection over the years. Uh, manga is a huge um, part of our collection. We have probably 90% of our students are Asian and that is something that they are really into and want to have in our collection. Um, so it's definitely been a lot of research on my end of what works, what's best for them. Um, you know, a lot of issues with collection development, as you said, just because of you know the difference in uh, what is acceptable in our culture. And so that's also brought up some questions with families and, um, but everyone's been very supportive. So that's kind of where I am on our end of this. All right, now Casey, your experience has uh, been kind of doubled uh, with last year serving on an award jury. How did that impact? What did you guys have in your district um, as far as graphic novels? And then how did that award impact you? what you now have? Really good question. Um, uh, I served on the 2020 Newberry and uh, I'll be very, very transparent. Uh, we had a wonderful committee. We did not go out to say we're going to nominate the very first graphic novel to win the Newberry. It just happened organically, just like that. And uh, prior to that, I have been kind of fighting with co-workers about the presence of graphic novels and, uh, and anime in the collection because unfortunately I have um, at the time I just had co-workers to be fair that didn't understand um, the um, you know graphic novels and comics and, and understanding that they didn't have to understand that they didn't understand I had to be patient with them and when new kid won then that's when I started blasting this out saying, see, I told you, I told you. And then slowly but surely, I had teachers that started to read New Kid. And they were like, wow, that was really good. Would well, you like this? Then try this and try this. And that's how it started. It's grown from that, from that point. So yeah, New Kid opened the door for a lot of things, you know, a lot of understanding on many levels. So um, now, in that, oh, I, I'm glad you pointed out some of the challenges there. Um, each of you, no doubt, have had this conversation with somebody on staff, somebody in administration, on how how you defended this to them. And I, I want to start. I want to go with Angie, and then because Casey, you you sort of answered that, but there's more. I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, Angie, what kind of what kind of questions do you get from? staff and partners and administrators and parents? How, how do you mitigate our, those challenges? Our staff and um, our um, administrators have been very supportive and instrumental in us building our collection. Um, more so it's the families that have the concerns. Of course, you know, they have middle school students. When you have grades, you know, six through eighth on a campus, you're dealing with 11 through potentially 14 year olds. And, you know, there's a wide range of what is acceptable at each one of those levels. And, you know, it's just more of listening to their concerns. I feel like sometimes they want to be heard, you know, more than anything else. It's just to get their point across. And then just to have that conversation of, you know, just the artwork and um, just the value that visual images add to what they are learning and what they're understanding. So it's definitely more of a conversation. Luckily, we have not had any full formal challenges. It's more of just that conversation, having them, you know, be heard and developing a relationship with the family. So. Joyce, is it similar for you? It, but you're now farther removed from that. You're actually in the administrative offices. Do you have these same kind of conversations? Um, you know, I really don't have them as much with parents, like Angie was saying, as I do with teachers and not librarians, just teachers <laughs> and, and librarians who work with teachers who have yet to see um, the value of a graphic novel as um, something that students will read independently or even as a part of the curriculum. And so it's, it's a part of 
really helping them understand the higher level thinking and critical thinking and attention to detail that is actually required of a person who reads a graphic novel. Do you feel that they, because they understand the images so immediately that they take that for granted? Is that part of it, you think? Maybe, or maybe they're not paying attention to the images like students do. Uh, right. I think that students are catching those details more than we are. Right. Good point. Kate, what about you? Um, I haven't had many interactions where people had a problem with me having graphic novels in the library. Um, I did have a couple kids tell me, oh, my parents said that I, she, they just want me to check out regular books. Um, and, you know, that's a parent choice. And what are you going to do <laughs> about that? Um, they can do what they want with their own child. So you just kind of have to let that let that go. Um, but with teachers, um, I come at them with, would you rather have a kid not read a single book in their lifetime? Or would you rather have them hooked on graphic novels and comics? And for me, that's a no brainer. And any educator would be like, oh, yeah, you know, if a kid is hesitant about the library, if a kid is not confident in their reading abilities, graphic novels can be that stepping stone for them. And why would we want to take that away from them? Good point. Casey, you want to follow up on that? Oh, I've had my share of fights. <laughs> I get in trouble a lot. <laughs> Wherever I have worked for 23 years, because I've always been that rebel librarian. Um, I've had teachers get really, really upset with me because, and even went to the principal to say, you're not, you know, she's not supporting the curriculum. She's not supporting me as a teacher. You know, and then I had to get a little creative, you know, um, in terms of reinforcing that this is my program, that's your classroom program. We're not going to overlap. You're not going to dictate to me and I'm not going to let you. But at the same time, I also understood that I have to make this easy for the, the child because it's they're going to be at the brunt end of all of this. So I would tell my students, listen, we're going to have a two book rule. You get a required book you, that your teacher wants you to read, then you get that leisure reading book that you can check out. And then when I started doing that, the teachers are like, oh. and they couldn't come up with an argument. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is I've also had to talk to the kids. Like I've had a teacher march a, a book down to the library and put it on the desk, mad. This is recent. And I'm like, what's going on now? He was reading this during my instructional uh, period. Okay, then I had to pull the kid to the side and say, okay, look, wait until the teacher tells you that it's your free time. Then you pull out that book don't pull it out during instruction because you're just adding fuel to the fire. But it was still couched as they're reading this graphic novel and they should be reading the classics. And I'm like, I don't jive like I don't I don't roll like that. <laughs> I, I I I stick strictly with what kids are interested in, and that's how I continue to um, to service students. It's what they're interested in, and I just move from there. Not the I try and help with the curricular side, but mm -mm. I don't. I don't want to say at kids. <laughs> All right, uh, yes. I want to, uh, Joy. I'm going to start with you. I, I get a sense of your demographics in your community, and also the other part of the question is, or part two, um, do you have a written collection development policy for your district? Okay. Um, it's really interesting. The demographics in Lincoln, Nebraska are not exactly what you would think they would be. Um, we are a large, diverse district, and actually um, Lincoln happens to be um, a refugee resettlement um, city, and so we have a lot of um, scholars who are refugees and actually um, and ELL students too who really love graphic novels. And then selection policy. Um, our selection policy, I actually had to look it up before today just to make sure I was on the right track here, um, is really more about curriculum and curriculum materials. Um, there are some pieces in our selection policy that our materials should have um, positive reviews and um, then at least perused by the person who's selecting the books or completely read by them for um, quality and um, alignment. Mm, let's see what else. Oh, and then there's a lot of, in our selection policy, a lot about diversity of collections. And 
boy, am I glad about that. And that just goes back to a, um, a Nebraska education law that requires us to have diverse materials in our schools and in our classrooms. And even our teachers have to take um, multicultural courses to be certified. So that's a pretty fun thing to see in our selection policy as well. But there's nothing specific to graphic novels. What's the date on the uh, on the policy? You, do you, is that obvious anywhere or is it, was that in place um, before you got in? It's been there. Um, okay. it's, pro it's board policy, so it's possible that it's been revised or edited, but right. it's been the same policy since I was in library school. Gotcha. Well, the reason why I was asking is that oftentimes graphic novel collection development triggers this conversation. Something mm -hmm. happens, there's a challenge in the public space. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I, I keep watching the school market to see how soon that becomes. And I realize the logistics in navigating those things are a little bit different actually much more different in the school space than they are in the public space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Angie, you're outside of Dallas? Yes, we are. Okay. We are about 20 minutes outside of Dallas. So, and your community make, makeup is? Well, we are very diverse. Um, we have a large influx of an Asian population and um, that has, you know, just been growing over the past probably 10 years. Um, it is a very diverse community and um, we are a large district. It's just, you know, it has changed. It has changed. And I love that our teachers, especially our language arts department across the board has been very supportive of the graphic novels. We've used those in numerous um, literature circles within our classrooms and it has just really taken off. I have grown our collection tremendously over the last few years, you know, just because of the demand that we are seeing and it's particularly manga. All right, All right Kate, tell us about uh, Yuma. Uh, Yuma, right on the border with Mexico, about 20, 20 minutes away. away. Um, our district uh, has about five schools. My school has the, the lowest uh, student population, but we're about 90% Latinx students, um, some native students. Um, and yeah, I like to build the collection that kind of reflects our students and reflects um, issues and has characters related to them. It's a really big deal. Representation is a really big deal. All right, Casey, is that um, the District of Columbia in total that you cover, or is it certain part? I actually used to live there, so I kind of know, you know, how the city's set up. But do you are you the district in general, or are you a certain segment of the city? I'm a certain segment of the city. Now, I'll, let me explain this. Uh, the school is located in Southwest DC near the wharf. If you're familiar with the area. Uh, but um, we're in Ward, uh, Ward 6, but at the same time, our students come from all over the city because of the type of um, uh, 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 lottery system, I guess you could say, that we have in our district. So I can have kids that are coming from Northwest, Southeast, you know, Southwest, you know, all over the city. So it's, it's a um, real interesting melting pot. Um, my uh, school is highly diverse uh, the, and the population is shifting and changing again. Um, so as I said earlier, what I have always done as a practice as a school librarian, and this is my 23rd year of teaching, is that I have always um, uh, just reflected on a selection of books that reflect my student body, their interests, their, um, their personal interests, their curricular interests. And then of course, we're focusing on the cornerstones, which is our district-wide curriculum. So we always ensure that we have those books in place so that uh, we can support instruction. And you know that's really important as well. You know, we want our kids reading leisurely, but we have to also support that curriculum. When you when you start a collection or start building a collection and you're working with the teachers, um, now that we're, oh my gosh, I think we're about 30 years into publishing graphic novels, is mm -hmm. your collection or your purchasing po policy, is it only the most recent publication dates or are you able to open that up and look as far back as you can for subject that matches what those teachers are using? Uh, you want me to answer? Sure. Okay, um, 
No, it's, I have a wonderful library director. In fact, he's on right now, Dr. Kevin Washburn. And one of the things that he really um, encourages us to do is, is that, you know, select books that are great for your, your, your student body. And sometimes it might be an older title. And sometimes it might be a current title. The Youth Media Awards just took place for crying out loud. So, you know, of course we're ready to place the order of uh, several books <laughs> and many of them were graphic novels, yay. So um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't have any um, variance. It's, it's whatever we feel that is gonna be a great addition to our collection. Joy, do those awards have a similar impact for you? Is it also reviews? It, what's your criteria in your, in your process? Um, yeah, awards would have a huge um, role in selecting books if we were opening a brand new school. Um, reviews would be a big part of that. Um, and I would say publication date doesn't necessarily come into play. I mean, we don't want to pick really old stuff that kids aren't going to read, but there are some books that are just classics that we're not ready to let go of yet. Um, so all of those things will come into play and student interest too. And then also making sure our collections are diverse. That's really important to us as well. Hey, Angie, with, um, with your collection development processes, um, how much interaction do you get from the teachers, the ones who are aware? Um, how much are they aware of graphic novels? And do you have any kind of a, a, a synergy there with your processes and bring, do they, are they part of that conversation? Yes, yes, they are. Um, many times they will come to me well in advance of a new sec a new book coming out or a new book in a series coming out and say, we have to get this. This is new. Our kids need it. Um, they are very much a part of that conversation as well as our students. So they definitely, they send me little requests. I have a Google form that they submit different things that they are interested in. And, you know, just as Joy and several people have stated, it is you know, very important, obviously, to make sure that we have those positive reviews from some of our professional resources, but then to make sure that we are, you know, meeting the needs of the students. Um, I also have history teachers that have recently asked to use Nathan Hale's work in their classroom. So we're working on that aspect, which is fantastic for the kids to not just see that in language arts, but now to see it in their history class as well. So, you know, as much as we can, you know, delve into the curriculum with this, I think that it is phenomenal for our students to have access to to our graphic novel collection. I love with Nathan's books that the even the research babies have their own fan base now, which mm -hmm. is really pretty cool. Now, uh, when I met Kate, um, she mentioned the uh, Eisner grant, graphic novel grant program. By the way, uh, for all of you watching, if you do a search on ALA's Eisner grant, you'll see the information on how to register for that and submit. It's, uh, oh, and a, yeah, it's a wonderful program. And that's how I met Kate. Um, you, Kate, actually, I think shocked some teachers when you first started your process, didn't you? Uh, it wasn't the most enthusiastic uh, welcome for graphic novels I've ever seen, but the kids were excited. And once teachers saw kids leaving the library with stacks of books, even if those books were manga or graphic novels, they were like, whoa, kids sitting in their classrooms, done with work, reading a book, whoa, wow. And now there's like, I think, I hope, a better respect for graphic novels on my campus. Um, I don't get a lot of teacher uh, curriculum used with graphic novels. To be fair, we use the Cambridge curriculum, which is, in my experience, a little harder to collaborate with than other things. Um, so mostly uh, I just push the list literacy aspect of graphic novels and like, listen, kids are reading, let's embrace this. Um, and for the most part, I think we've been pretty successful. Uh, real quick, I wanna call out a couple of things that I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, Kevin Washburn put up a link to Unshelved, which is one of the funniest web comics out there that deal with comics and graphic novels in the library space. Um, those guys are hilarious. And thank you, Kevin, for posting that because that, yeah, for anybody watching, please hit that link and you'll see one of the funniest setups for a, a, a librarian explaining comics to a parent. Um, okay, so in your approach to collection development, okay, and you actually started 
Um, I had a, you started your collection then. We've got a couple of questions out of the Philippines and India um, of where do I begin? Like what, what are the best ways to start this conversation with, with my students? And uh, to follow up on that is um, how to effectively display those books. So Kate, if you want to take a swing at that since you're still on screen here with me. Yeah, um, how do you start assembling your collection? I would recommend just as a jumping off point, looking at those reward award book lists, um, but also just talk to your students and see what they're into. I really gear my collection towards student interests um, and also pay attention to what they're talking about, what they're excited about. Pay attention to what your kids are watching, even playing like The Witcher is huge. It has a Netflix, Netflix show, but there's also novels and there's now graphic novels. Um, yeah, just talk to your students. That's the best thing. I can honestly see what they're into and get a gauge of where their interests at, where their maturity levels are at, and then use those reward, award, I keep saying rewards, <laughs> use those award um, book lists to kind of see, okay, that would fit in with this interest that would fit in here. Uh, you don't have to buy the entire list of the re award books. Um, just get what you think will work. Go ahead, Thank Angie. I, I see Angie nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I agree. Um, and, you know, just like she said, you know, just starting slow and you know, maybe if it's a large series, like some of, especially some of the manga series are mm -hmm. huge, you know, have 80 books, um, start with a few, see how it goes. You know, um, our graphic novel collection is literally at the front door. Like when they walk in, that's the first mm -hmm. thing they see. I have displays of those. Um, it's one of the first things that, you know, they gravitate towards and it's just, a great place for them to immediately see it as they walk in and all of our staff, you know, it's important that they see that that is what our students are interested in as well. So, so when you're engaging the kids in this conversation, do they understand there's a level of trust here in the books that they're recommending to you? I, I think so. I mean, I think that they, um, you know, they want to be heard and they want to, you know, share at, and we hear them recommending to one another you know in the hallways or you know in the library they're like book talking in the shelves so it's fantastic and i love how enthusiastic they are about this collection so uh, joy for you from the administrative role do you guys uh, in your in lincoln do you keep your books in a, a special collection or do they interfile is it or is it on a case-by-case -case basis it is on a case by case basis. We let our librarians make those decisions about their collections. However, I will say in most of the libraries I spend my time in, um, the graphic novels are their very own collection. And my personal preference is that they are. And there are a lot of things I like interfiled. I will say that. Um, but graphic novels need to be on their own in their own collection where our students can find them easily. So um, that is what I see in most of our libraries. Well, we're kind of, I think we, we saw this kind of genrefication approach happening in the public library space, and it was driven by graphic novels, but it seems that it's just our natural tendencies to look for that collection, and where the Diary of Anne Frank may disappear as a graphic novel memoir over next to memoirs, but suddenly it starts circulating once it's in that stack, so it's, you know, even though it's part of the manga collection, it still gets visibility there. Um, Casey, with your students, um, do you have any kind of committees of students that give you input on your books? Or is this, you're watching these numbers and you're you're reacting you know, on the fly or? I have outspoken middle schoolers <laughs> that will tell me what they want. <laughs> and they have introduced me to titles that I wasn't very familiar with. For example, The Lumberjanes. You know, I, I never heard of that series, uh, but we have a very strong pride club at our school. So as a result of it, a lot of those kids are reading the books um, with, uh, uh, that are similar to The Lumberjanes. And so I was like, okay, fine. And it was kind of like a little test because three of them came up to the desk and they said, well, we really want you to order The Lumberjanes. And I'm like, 
you know, that's how I was. And they were like, oh, she's cool. So that's how that trust gets established with mm-hmm. kids. And they will come back and they will make recommendations. And I will tell them, well, let me do my research on my end and then I'll see what I can do. You know, I make it just that simple. And the parents, they appreciate it, you know, because they, they, they see that the kids are excited about reading. And I will say this, I had an administrator, she was a 42 year uh, tenured administrator. And I started working in her building and she said this, I've never seen kids skip into the library. <laughs> Boys and girls. And you know what it was, it, what, what, uh, why they were skipping? They were, coming, they were coming back several times a day to check out graphic novels, anime, you know, just back and forth, back and forth, comments, you know, because that's their thing. That's what they look for. So if I can well, supply it, I'm gonna make it happen. And be, as we were getting ready to go live for this, we were talking about those shelf spaces, those stack spaces where manga or graphic novels are usually kept are the ones that seem to be empty all the time, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And jacked up. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, Always messy. <laughs> does, does Lexile and AR, how do those play into this at all? Is that is that part of the consideration when you're making purchases? Because Lexile is starting to, I think, be a bit more accurate on how they apply. I know it's one of those that's a lightning rod bit of conversation. I can see everybody's expressions, by the way. But does that play a role in in how you purchase? No. No. Uh, no. Wow. No. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> no. Um, and here's a term that is actually quite new to me. We've got um, um, an educator on our staff um, that introduced a word to me that I'd never heard of, and it's a reconsideration policy. Do you guys, uh, I see Kate shaking her head, Joy, yes. Joy, yeah. tell me about your, how does that work? Um, it's really a pretty simple process. Basically, if a parent expresses a concern about a book, usually they'll go to the principal or the teacher, the librarian first, um, well, teacher, librarian, or principal. And um, our librarians are to listen and hear them out. Um, They might read the book really quick that night when they get home. You just never know. (laughs) Um, But usually that conversation is where it stops. Uh, Most of the time you can have a conversation and it doesn't go any further than that. But if the parents really do want to um, pursue it further, they can talk to our director of library services. There is a form that they fill out. It's very official. And then a committee is formed to read the book and talk about the book and a decision is made. And then the parents um, or community member too that may um, have an issue um, are informed of the decision that has been made. I can tell you that um, as far as I know in our district, a book has never been pulled off the shelves because of um, a reconsideration. It doesn't happen very often, um, but it does happen. And the most that maybe that has ever occurred as a result is maybe just a shift from middle school to high school or something like, or elementary to middle school or something like that. That kind of ties into having though a collection development policy in place so that you're prepared for those. It sounds like there is a process, so you're ready for that. Yeah. Um, Angie, has your experience been similar? Have you have you ever had any kind of challenges like that? Um, no formal challenges, but yes, we have had a few who just want to again voice their concern. And once they feel that they've been heard and listened to, and you can explain why that book is on the shelf, most are fine with that and understand. They they may not want their child to read it, but are understanding that we don't censor for everyone and it is a library for all. So that is, you know, a very important conversation. And again, it's just that listening piece and building a relationship of trust with them. I see a note here from Darlene in the chat. She has a student library assistance board slab Hmm. and so many recommendations come from them. They also process graphic novels. Uh, Do each of you have that kind of similar setup? Do you have that kind of a, a, a student advisory board as well or? I do not. You do not? Okay. I think we see that at the public library here, but um, nothing formal unless it's something done at the building level. Right. Gotcha. What about you, Kate? 
I don't have anything like that. Most of my recommendations just come from the kids I see every day coming into my library. Um, and my student, I have student workers and TAs, um, library TAs and library student workers, and they will help me. And I will obviously see them every day as well. And we're talking about books all the time. Right, and Casey, aside from the very vocal students you have telling you what to bring <laughs> in, do you have any kind of a formal group or do you have a student advisory group that you work with? Um, I have a teacher board and I also have like a loose student advisory group of students that will come in and make recommendations. Uh, it's important as librarians that we do have the, the, the staff members in place just in, in the event that we do have what's called a challenge. Uh, I formerly worked for Chicago Public Schools and back in 2013, Persepolis was a book that was challenged heavily. And um, when you really break, you can, you can Google the story, but um, when you really look at what happened, it was a principal that did not listen to the school librarian about the importance of the reconsideration policy and how it's to be followed. Um, they instructed the librarian to pull the book off the shelf. And then that's when you know, a lot of things started to quickly happen from there and the American Library Association got involved and, you know, and it was ended, ended up uh, uh, lying down flat. The book is back in, in the school system, but it when you start looking back at the process of what happened, it, it, it was like if, if the district officials were a little more educated, um, it wouldn't have gotten the national attention that it would have gotten at that time. Oh, so it was administration that didn't follow the steps of the policy. Exactly. Ah. That's what happened. It was a librarian that was trying to educate them and tell them along the way, but they were not listening. They were more responsive to a couple of parents that were complaining about that title. And again, you know, we will always have people that will have some type of objection to books that are in our collection, but we should not allow it to um, prevent other children to have the freedom to read what they want to read. You know, so if you don't want your child reading a particular book, then that's your personal business and I'll respect that. But you can't blanket it across the board with the rest right. of the children I serve. Right. Um, okay, let's talk about balancing digital and hard copy. Angie, mm -hmm. um, how, obviously with, the, with, with COVID, this has changed things considerably, but prior to that, what was the normal blend for you of digital plus hard copy for graphic novel content? It, it was definitely smaller previously. Um, we have increased our ebook digital collection tremendously since last March. Um, but prior to that, it was much smaller than what it is now. Um, I feel like, you know, we, it is a need. They need to have access. Our students are digital natives. We are one-to-one -one iPads in our district, so all students have access. We use the platform Mac and Via for our host for all of our eBooks, which is phenomenal. And um, it has really transformed the number of eBooks that we circulate per year last year alone. Um, along with that being COVID, we were well into 60,000 eBooks circulated for the year. So I, I have a campus of about 1,100 students uh, to give you some perspective. So it's definitely come a long way and we have a lot of room for growth, so. Was that 60,000 checkouts or 60,000 yes. titles? Checkouts, Check okay. Yes, 60,000 right. checkouts for the year. So. Um, Kate, what about your experience with that? Oh, well, I feel kind of shameful now. I, uh, in my time at Yuma High School, I honestly haven't had a single student um, approach me with any interest in uh, digital uh, graphic novels or books in general. Uh, and I don't get a lot of money to purchase books. So I've chosen to focus mostly on the physical collection. Um, COVID has made me regret <laughs> that circumstance, uh, but it just kind of is a, what it is at this point. I've tried to make my collection more accessible to students by doing a curbside pickup, which I know is not like a silver bullet situation, but um, yeah, I just, haven't ha found the interest or need to invest in that. And so I've kind of invested my budget elsewhere. Gotcha. Going from the administrator's position, seeing that shift uh, must have been kind of dramatic over the past year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's been kind of dramatic. Um, and really, 
pushed our teachers and curriculum specialists to think a little bit more about digital collections. I'm going to say our students still really like print. Honestly, they do. But you have to have what is available to them. And the biggest thing that we needed in March, April, and May was multi-user content for our students to read. I've never seen more frustrated teachers when the book that they wanted, that novel that they have taught for years, is not available in ebook format or is wow. not a multi-user option. And um, that has that was really, um, really hard. And it'd be like, come on, pick a new book. Pick a new book, please. <laughs> but um, yeah, we have seen a, a huge shift to, to digital. But I will say, um, kids, Kids still like print when they can get yeah. their hands on it. They they love to flip through the book. Well, there is that tactile experience, yeah. and especially when you're dealing with these multiple colors, this you know four color format, all these images. Um, that feel the paper feels different. There's a quality difference to it. So it is really uh, to me, it's a wonderful thing that digital gives us the opportunity to access that. But if it's really good, we want to own that. And I'm going to, I'm going to now go to a few questions that are coming up somehow directly to me. Uh, Lynn Carlton um, asked, do you consider Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Dork Diaries to be graphic novels? And I'll let you guys answer, but there's, there's a bit of trivia to this too as well. <laughs> um, so since you're on the big screen, Joy, right now, uh, do you? Do you have a catalog as, as 741.5? No, I do not. And that's strictly from a cataloging perspective. Right. I think they are kind of transitional between the two. And you shaking her head, yes. Yeah, um, we have them in our fiction collection, not in our graphic novel collection. Mm -hmm. Same Kate? with me. Yeah. Yep, fiction. Casey? Casey, same? Uh, uh, no, I have it in the graphic novels. And you know what? One of the things that got us to this moment that allowed books like Smile and Dogman and Captain Underpants to get in there is because Wimpy Kid, when it hit, was miscatalogued and as a graphic novel. And as the demand started hitting really hot for Wimpy Kid, people were, administrators were making the purchase when they were looking at graphic novels, they were looking at these line items and making that purchase. So that mistake, whoever made it, thank you very much, because <laughs> now we have this entire wonderful world in the middle school market and actually in the elementary in the library space as well because Wimpy Kid was not cataloged correctly so Lynn I hope that answered um mm -hmm. it's really a hybrid but it, it doesn't get cataloged as a graphic novel um okay so Molly and I can't pronounce your last name and I should because my name is Polish so uh Molly Mez uh, Mestrick uh best manga books for K to six I have so many sixth graders who are requesting manga mm -hmm. um Anybody, I'm going to start with Naruto, but Angie, go yes, ahead. Same. Uh, Naruto, Boruto, um, my, um, let's see, other popular ones are um, Shuga. Um, I'm trying to think right now on the spot. I'm like, oh, what oh, else? Sorry. <laughs> One, Punch, One Punch Man is also <laughs> El. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Yes. Dragon Ball? Dragon, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Drive. Um, yes. Fairy. And Molly. Molly, Fair. we'll have a list for you that you can go to for that yeah. as well. Um, Katie, what do you got? One Piece, Dragon Ball Z. Oh, yeah. Um, Naruto. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, and it's, it's like, I'm trying to think of, you know, because we've been virtual since last March. So those are the top three that my students are crazy about. Okay, so for all of you then, one of the challenges, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, one of the challenges with these manga series is Naruto, I think, is up near 80. And, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Um, and on top of that, they're the most stolen books in the collection, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes, I have them all. <laughs> but it's because of my demographics and that's what they want. So right. I don't know that in a, a different situation, I would have all of them. Um, you know, it is expensive and they do have the three in one collections now as well, but um, it's, it's expensive. So go ahead, Casey. Oh yeah. Now, now see, this is where I, I love talking about this. We've been virtual since March 13th of um, to 2020. And my wonderful library director um, 
got us access to Sora. And mm -hmm. Sora combines your public uh, library and your district and school library collections together. Now, Naruto and many other titles, if you get a multiple, you know, um, uh, multiple access, you know, you know, for these titles, you'd have like a bunch of kids looking at that book at the same time. And that's absolutely like maximizing their, their ability to enjoy those titles. So our SOAR usage as a district has been very high. And it's been very uh, interesting to see kids really taking to it very well. We use it through our Clever platform, which is a single sign-on um, platform. But also too, I wanna to add this in, um, we just got access to Comic Access, which is that uh, comic and graphic novels catalog, um, catalog. So I went back to my little group that is my little advisory group and I said, hey, look, we have opportunity to get, get some more titles. So give me some, you know, just some titles and boy, did those titles come in fast. So that's gonna be going very live very soon. I'm sorry, unlimited access um, to these titles is really great because uh, when the kids are able to access like a Sora or either a, um, a comic access, you know, it just maximizes their uh, ability to access great books and read what they want to read. I'm going to go back to uh, Whippy Kid as a conversation for this real quick. Um, somebody here, I kind of see Dogman in graphic novel, but Wimpy Kid and Nate are in fiction. Big Nate actually strikes me as I've seen in a lot of public library spaces where Big Nate, Wimpy Kid, and um, the rest of those are actually, and Dogman are all in that graphic novel. Is that wrong? Have it in that graphic novel collection? We it have is... Big Nate. Big Nate's in our graphic novel collection. Okay. So Dogman okay. too, well, but not Wimpy Kid. But it wouldn't be wrong if Wimpy Kid was in that, included in that. Okay. Right. Because that kind of, that's one of those um, oh, marquee titles that the kids are going to find somewhere in the building. Right. It's almost as if you want to, it's like when a supermarket decides to shift everything around on you again, and they know that if they put the milk and bread in a different place, they're going to sell more items around it. Um, so um, hang on. if I could go, go back actually to the whole question of like, all right, there's so many manga volumes. What do I do? Um, I built my collection from a very small collection to a pretty large collection at this point. And something that I started doing is if I got a recommendation or a request from a student uh, with a popular manga, I would maybe buy like 10 and see how it goes. If it's just that one kid who's bugging you and they're the only kid checking it out after you get just 10, then don't buy anymore. Um, I also like to buy a um, an extra copy of volume one because when it's new multiple kids are checking it out so that way one kid's inevitably slower than the other so one kid races through and the other kid can follow behind uh, so those would be my recommendations for starting a manga collection all right uh favorite resource sites that you guys like to use um off the top i'll start with um texas uh, tla texas library association's um, Texas Mavericks and the Little Mavs are two brilliant lists. Um, they go back 10 years now, right, Angie? I believe so, yes. That's, I think that's I, about right. Juan, um, when he is our rep for back and he started that and he has been phenomenal in helping me to grow our collection. So. For those of you who haven't met Tuan Wen yet, um, he is the ultimate instigator. Yes. One of the <laughs> nicest people, on, best smile on the planet, which is really wonderful. Um, uh, great graphic novels for teens, the Yalsa list that comes out every year. Um, I've been on the publishing side of this, and we, as soon as one of our books made that list, that was a big, that and the Mavericks was like an award for us, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty cool. Anybody else have some recommendations as far as lists that they look at for as buying purchasing tools. Yalsa was, Yalsa is a big one. If you're, yeah, you should, everyone should pretty much pay attention to that. Um, How about No Flying No Tights? That's Robin Brenner's website. Do you use that, Kate? I have not. Very familiar. For, okay, so for those of you, No Flying No Tights um, all together, and I'll actually, this will be included as part of our resources. Um, is a great review site. It's all librarians and several teachers who look at um, 
uh, Western comics as well as manga series. And you get um, why the book is good. Um, and in many cases where the, the age group is appropriate for that book. Um, which I think deal. publishers in general are getting pretty good at that. There's still some that um, haven't figured out uh, that some material is not uh, 12 plus, it's uh, uh, 19. Um, <laughs> but that, I think the challenges are less with that, right? Angie, you've been collecting for a while now, right? Yes, yes, I have. And, you know, we, you know, I feel like it's just, you have to know your community and what's going to work well. Um, but for the most part, it's been pretty um, easy going for us. So I hope that everyone has that experience, but I know that's not the case. Right. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, just reaching out to your reps that you purchase you know, books through is a huge place to begin if you are at a loss as to where to start. Um, you know, all the publisher lists, they send out emails weekly. So any of those would be helpful. So definitely, you know, just use those resources. All right, Joy, I'm going to come to you real quick, but I want to, uh, Molly posted, uh, I, thank you, Molly, for reminding me of this. School Library Journal has a blog called Good Comics for Kids. Bridget Alberson mm -hmm. drives that one. Um, it's a brilliant resource. Um, Joy, what do you, do you have anything like Kirkus or Booklist or any of those that you follow with review wise that are critical to you? I um, actually, uh, it's kind of interesting. I use Mackin to read those reviews. So I actually follow all of them um, because I'm, one of my responsibilities is, aside from graphic novels is the development of a, a diverse book collection called The Mosaic. And so I'm always reading um, reviews to select books for that collection. And so in Mackin, I can just um, kind of read through all of them really easily in one place. So, it's pretty nice that they aggregate all that stuff for you. Mm -hmm, they do. And it's, it's fantastic. And I can be, you know, if I am looking through Kirkus reviews, but I, I open that particular book, then I can see all of the other reviews at the same time, which is super, super nice. It's fun to see how they disagree and how they agree. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we use, we use all of those when selecting books. I also want to say that as a librarian, when I had students coming to me asking me for more graphic novels and more manga in the collection, I didn't feel really knowledgeable at the time. And I did want to make sure at this elementary school they were age appropriate. I honestly went to the bookstore and um, you can see a lot of books there and you can flip through them and make informed decisions that way. I bought a few, read them at home. Um, so sometimes, or even going to your public library and just perusing the, the print collection is really, really helpful in making choices. Well, it's pretty interesting me as a development for the market, you have a retailer who understands what graphic novels are and as well as your public library system. That's, that's kind of unusual. It's, it's oftentimes I've discovered it's one of those is the one that becomes a leader and understands that, but it's kind of nice that you've got those resources. Hey, Casey, you pointed, you posted something in the chat. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the executive board for the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And over the summer, there was a um, group of librarians that worked with um, ALA's graphic novels and comic, uh, comic, uh, comics roundtable. And they created a list that was based off of our social unrest that was taking place over the summer. Um, and so they created the um, Black Lives Matter uh, reading list, but uh, it's it's important. I feel that not only do you look at these lists, but you know, just stay abreast of various unique lists that come out and produced by various um, uh, round tables in, um, in, in ALA because they really do have the heartbeat of what's taking place. And not only just with ALA, check in with your state library association. Many of them are creating their own very unique book lists that are, act, um, are absolutely dynamite. So like we just talked about Texas Library Association, you know, New Jersey's done a lot of great work. Um, California, it goes on and on and on. So it's just a matter of tapping in maybe through Twitter, through their state library associations, start following them. And then that's how you learn about the different lists that are out there. You know, and that reminds me of some, a point I wanted to go back to on when you're going into, for those of you who are just getting into this, dump your publication date and see how far back you can go on subject matter because it has been 30 years now. 
that there's been a very solid amount of progress in the type of subject matter that's covered. And, uh, you know, Casey, there was, some, uh, there was a book that uh, I was reminded of when you started talking about the unrest, um, a great story from a top shelf called uh, uh, B.B. Wolf and the Three LPs is about um, a, it's based on a true story of a town in the South that was eliminated for the construction of some factories. And it was a black community that was starting to thrive and it was just very similar to the Tulsa riots. And um, so these conversations in the graphic novel world have been going on for quite some time. So it's not just the most recent titles that are out there, but there's a whole rich history of these stories that you can reach to. Um, we have three minutes left, you guys. Uh, I this is, yeah, thank you <laughs> so much for this. Um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and, and wrap this up again real quick. Uh, if uh, if people want to reach out to you guys, are you okay with that? Yes. Everybody should uh, cool. Um, we're going to list all these re uh, uh, resources that we referenced for you, um, so they'll be available on the Library of Past website. There'll be a link that's going to go out. Um, Guy, Guy is our engineer on this, and I'm hoping I'm not just pulling stuff off the top of my head here, but we will make sure that those resources are available for you. Texas Mavericks, do a search on that. ALA Graphic Novel Roundtable. Casey Boyd has her website linked there in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out to these folks. They've been at this for a while. Um, you're, even though this is new to you, it's not new to them. And our job is to make that road as smooth as we can get it for you so that you don't have the challenges and surprises. So again, thank you, uh, Angie Mahalik, Joy Harvey, Kate Zekshevsky, Casey Boyd. So much appreciate your time this evening. And um, we'll see what the next one. Oh, the next panel we're doing is on reading support for gifted, challenged, reluctant ELA, ESL readers. Um, and that'll be next month. So thank you everybody on behalf of Library Pass and Comics Plus. My name is John Shableski and uh, thanks for joining us. <laughs>